This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Richard Rosecrantz, who is adjunct professor of public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, research professor of political science at the University of California, and senior fellow in Harvard, at Harvard's Belfer Center for Science and Technology. His new book is The Resurgence of the West, How a Transatlantic Union can prevent war and restore the United States and Europe. Richard, welcome back to Berkeley. I'm delighted to be here. It's been a long time. Where were you born and raised? I was born and raised essentially in Milwaukee, but raised in Evanston, Illinois, where my father was at Northwestern. So I started out in Wisconsin, then moved very quickly to Illinois. And, and looking back, how did your parents shape your thinking about the world? Well. I think the interesting thing about the Midwest is that it's isolated from the world. And so you could get a really good education there, but in terms of seeing what other countries are like, hearing other languages spoken, it was isolated. And um, my parents did themselves travel quite a bit, not necessarily with me, uh, but they went abroad uh, and uh, they had uh, things to do abroad, arrangements. My father was in the School of Education at Northwestern, then he was in the School of Education at NYU when we moved to New York. Um, and he spent a certain amount of time in conversation with his colleagues in other countries. And this gave me the notion that maybe I should know something more about the outside world. Mm -hmm. And did you have, uh, uh, when did you get hooked, do you think? on international relations, was that uh, when you were getting well, <laughs> undergraduate degree? I think it actually was between Swarthmore and Harvard. Um, at Swarthmore, I was interested in international relations, had a very good course in it given by Jerry Mangone, but I was still very interested in political theory. Then when I got to Harvard, uh, political theory was still relevant, but it wasn't relevant to solving the then questions of the time. You could say that liberal government and democracy were the long-term solutions, but how to get there was something that was left open. So all of a sudden, the international relations question became very important. And two of my teachers, you know, both William Eliot and uh, also Carl Friedrich, focused on the need to do something more than just political theory. Mm -hmm. And and uh, who were some of the other? either professors you had there or TAs that went on to this field? Yeah, well, I had two pretty good TAs. One was Henry Kissinger, <laughs> uh, and he was the TA in Eliot's uh, Contemporary Political Theory Seminar, and he, and he made some very interesting uh, uh, comments on the papers, and he only gave me an A-, minus, which irritated me at the time, but uh, <laughs> I can certainly understand his argument for doing so. And then in Friedrich's seminar, which was on um, comparative government and totalitarianism, the um, TA was his big Brzezinski, and he graded the papers there. And I think I may have done somewhat better as a result of that. But nonetheless, uh, they were all interested in doing things with the outside world, and they recognized that might be that the outside world would actually be determinative for the United States and for the West as a whole. And if we didn't deal effectively with the outside world, we would be in trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, and what did you do your dissertation on and who did you do it under? I did it under Eliot and I did it on Australia, which seemed like a strange topic to pick. But at that time, everyone was doing Western Europe and I was looking for something else. 
Um, also, there was a very interesting test case, which is an international relations test case, of Australia and Japan. Australia had, of course, been among the most critical of the Japanese, 1939, 1940, through the war and so on. And they were the most insistent on a restrictive peace on Japan. Um, and they were very dubious that Japan could change in any way. On the other hand, even though that was their view up till 1945 or 46, by 1951-52, they signed an extremely lenient Japanese peace treaty that took the Japanese off the hook. Uh, and they even participated in the ANZUS Pact with the United States, which uh, helped to shore up security in the Pacific. So the question I was asking was, how could this change in Australian policy have taken place in just six years' time? And you can imagine what my answer was. It was a shift in the balance of power, that mm. as long as Japan was the enemy, you could see why, of course, one would balance against it. But once the enemy became, quote unquote, Russia and China in 1951-52, and the United States was heavily involved, you could look at uh, Japan as at least a partial ally, and that would enable you to be much easier in the peace settlement than before. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you are, uh, I guess you would say, an IR theorist. That, that's what, how you establish it. Is that a fair? Well, I think that's probably fair. Yeah. Yes. yeah that's so, right. so help us understand if students are watching this program, what, what, are the, what, is the, what are the skills that you have to acquire in your studies to, to prepare to do that kind of work? Well, of course, there are many people who don't do what I would regard as necessary. They look at data sets, they look at numbers purely, and they assume that without really knowing anything about the subject, just classifying and uh, calculating the relationships uh, in these data sets will tell you what's going on in international relations. I've always thought that a much deeper knowledge of both history and economics was required in order to get an idea of what was really going on, what, what occasioned the data rather than just what the data was. And so unlike some other uh, international relations theorists, I've seen development in the system over time with historic change and of course economic change. And as a result, uh, you have to sort of use those techniques, historical and economic techniques, uh, to project ahead and decide what is likely to come up in the future. Uh, and what about temperament? Uh, yes. <laughs> well, I think there is a difference in temperament. Um, if you were to look at the 18th century and the 19th century, there was this notion of equilibrium. I won't quite say it was balance of power. But it was a notion, of course, it was disrupted by Napoleon and by others, et cetera. But nonetheless, the background, nation, uh, background notion was really of equilibrium, that countries could be like an 18th century string quartet. They could play in unison. Mm -hmm. And so we did, in fact, have from 1815 to 1848 or so what was called the Concert of Europe with all the great powers participating together uh, until it was broken down by the revolutions of 1848. But nonetheless, for a considerable period of time, you have something that did allow the great powers to focus on unity. Um, and um, as a result of that, you didn't have to have the balance of power that otherwise, some people say, always has to constitute the major uh, causative factor and the ma major um, uh, balancing uh, element uh, in international politics. You could get together with everyone playing their part in a concert. But now what about the temperament of the people studying this equation? Uh, yes, well, <laughs> the people studying it, uh, it seemed to me, have to consider not just, you know, professional football. Uh, it, is, <laughs> it is very easy to think in terms of the clash of nations as the same thing as the clash uh, of the uh, patriots uh, and the saints, uh, where everything goes down to the final play and a sudden pass, pass is thrown and, and caught, and that crushes the enemy. Um, because in world politics generally, and this is not true without some exceptions, 
you never crush an enemy. The enemy always comes back. So you have to ask yourself, what, are, what is our policy going to be after the war? You have to think even during the war, what can we do to provide some sort of equilibrium uh, that is, has been disrupted by the conflict? And so the people who are studying this, it seems to me, also have to have this forward-looking appreciation of the fact that things can change and developments are taking place. Uh, and uh, you don't have a steady state international system that is the same at all times and places. What, what is, do you see as the relationship between theory and practice? I mean, does, does, does good theory emerge but before the world has changed or does it come after the, the evolution has occurred? I think it usually comes after uh, because until the war is over, you're not quite sure what caused it. And then having seen what caused it, you can try to figure out what can we do the next time to prevent it from occurring again. Now, sometimes this is a very uh, persuasive and understanding attempt at uh, uh, an analysis, uh, but in other cases it, it isn't always perfect. Consider Woodrow Wilson, for example, who had a theory of what had caused World War I and thought that if you really set up a League of Nations, that would somehow prevent a World War I from being caused again. Uh, now, of course, it is true the United States didn't go into the League of Nations. But even if we had done so, that organization was so hemmed in by restrictions of all kinds that the notion that that would have solved the problems presented by World War II, I think, uh, is quite unlikely. So that sometimes your theory, even though it's derived from the previous war, can be quite incorrect. On the other hand, theories in other cases, I think, have been much more nearly correct. After World War II, we recognized two things. One, we had to deter the Soviet Union. But also, over the longer period of time, we recognized that we had to bring the Soviet Union back into the system again as a player, just like people brought back France after 1815 and they brought back Germany after 1871. Um, and I think we're going to face this issue vis-a-vis -vis China over time. China is a rapidly growing power. There is going to be a competition between the United States and China. And the question is, how can we regulate the competition so that even after, I don't mean to say we're going to have a war because I don't think so, but even after the peak of competition has been achieved, we can have a return to a system not entirely unlike the concert of Europe in the, in the ages of the past. Mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the case of your uh, TA instructors, yes. both seem to demonstrate that a theorist could become a, a powerful policymaker, even though both, in the case of both gentlemen, they didn't always get everything right. Yes. Uh, was that an anomaly, you think, or uh, uh, is theory a good place uh, uh, for a policymaker to, to know what he should be doing? I think it's a good place to start. Mm -hmm. um, and many of the great diplomatists of the past, I mean, you can hardly say they were theorists, uh, but people like Castlereagh or uh, Metternich or Talleyrand knew a tremendous amount about the previous system of international relations and they were trying to recapture it and bring about a peace that existed previously. And without that knowledge, I think, you know, things could have been much, much worse. They were, in their sense, you know, theorists of one kind or another of the balance of power and how to use it in a way that was not entirely competitive uh, and uh, provoking of conflict. Uh, before we talk about your new book, uh, uh, it seems that in looking at your past work, you have been uh, focused on the, uh, uh, the evolution of the state over time in different systems, uh, especially the interface of the state with the international economy. Is, is that a fair statement? Yes, that's right. And uh, the basic thesis that I've offered, which I think now has to be slightly modified, but uh, was that in the past, the only way of a state progressing 
was to conquer more territory, get more people, get more resources, get more uh, technology, whatever it might be. And so the basic way of a state growing in the past, say up through some point in the 18th century probably, was simply territorial expansion. Um, but most of the economic historians will say, certainly some of the great French economic historians will say, after 1815, it was no longer true that waging war and trying to acquire territory was the best means of advancing your country economically. There were other ways that were much better. I mean, free trade was a way of doing it that didn't require you to take over and conquer someone else's real estate. And so all of a sudden, another method you know, came to the fore. And I think that um, we see that particularly after 1945, the territorial method was still with us you know, all the way up through the 1930s and into World War II. And it's sometimes been with us you know, during the Cold War as well. But I think uh, it is interesting that even though the Soviet Union had all of that real estate, it didn't finally persevere or succeed against the West because it didn't grow economically uh, at the rate that the conquest of the territory was supposed to produce. Whereas countries that didn't do that, like Japan and Germany and the United States and others, um, managed without conquering territory to improve their position very, very successfully, so much so that in the end, by 1989 or so, there was not just a balance of power, but a huge overbalance of power on the Western side. Uh, uh, before we, we talk about where you see the resurgence of the West, th there are two points that you make in the, in the course of your analysis that, that I, I think I want to emphasize at this point. You, you point out that there is uh, a, an intrinsic difference between economic and political power mm. and, and what they lead to. Explain that because it's a very important point. Well, I think that economic power is not zero sum. It can be increasing sum, such that country A and country B can both improve their economic position uh, without having to conflict with one another through economic growth. But in the political side of things, if you're looking at it certainly from a relative standpoint, if one country improves its position politically, the second country or the com uh, competing great power will be regarded to have lost. So it's much more of a zero-sum conflict than an increasing-sum conflict. So that if you can get the system to focus more upon economic power and less upon political, you could see the amount of conflict in the system go down. And, and the, the, the move from one to the other, in a way, involves uh, the, the dissipation of this emphasis on standing prestige, uh, uh, a relative power. Mm -hmm. But that then draws in, which is the second point I wanted to emphasize, the domestic system. Yes. And, and you point out that uh, states must meet political needs and demands of uh, its citizenry, right. unlike a firm. Right. So, so the, 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 the hope for what economic resurgence and union might bring is vulnerable to that equation. Yes, that's right. If you were to have a whole range of great powers suddenly lapse into authoritarianism or to enhance whatever authoritarianism they already had, um, I think that would be a great problem for the international system as a whole. On the other hand, if countries move to become more democratic, more rule of law, more concern about uh, economic openness and welfare for their citizens, that can be, it isn't necessarily, but it can be a stable outcome. And if it's a stable outcome inside, it can sustain also a stable outcome in terms of relationships with other countries who also hopefully are, are democratic or moving toward democracy. So if that takes place, if the, if the inside goes along with the outside, you can eventually get a system that is much more stable than the autocracies of the 18th century were or whatever you had, you know, going back to the empires of China and India and Rome and so on. 
Uh, in in uh, uh, with this as a background, uh, let's talk about your argument of where we might be able to achieve the resurgence of the West. And and you quote uh, uh, Stephen Tolman, uh, the name of the game will be influence, not force, implying that, that there's a new stage in which power and force have run up against their limits. So, so how do we deal with a world where that has happened? Well, it's difficult. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not simple. Um, if you have a coercive relationship with somebody else, you can simply tell them what to do and, ho and hopefully from your standpoint they do it. But if you have an inf a relationship that's based upon influence and not control, not power in the uh, heavy aspect of that term, then of course you have to use diplomacy, uh, you have to be concerned about what's going on domestically within the affairs of the other country, you have to try to support the democratic influences and the economic orientation influences that exist inside the other country. I mean, one of the problems we had with the Soviet Union, you know, before it broke up uh, in 1991, was that it didn't really have an orientation economically. All it did was produce oil and natural gas and sell it to the rest of the world. It didn't have an economy that was creating value for the world. And uh, Soviet industry, in this sense, was so far behind the West that um, there was no way that they could sustain their end of the bargain between us in terms of influence. Uh, whereas at the same time, uh, the Western countries, Britain, France, Germany particularly, Japan, and to some degree the United States also, were uh, developing economically in a way that was very sustaining and would continue to support um, a commitment both to themselves and to trying to work things out with the outside world in a way that wasn't possible for autocracies that were still concerned about maintaining power at home. So, so the idea that you're proposing is that uh, a customs union and a free trade agreement between uh, the U.S. and Europe would uh, be the platform from which both would enjoy increased economic growth, research and development, uh, uh, and economic benefits for both of their peoples uh, uh, in a way that the conquest of territory no longer does. That's exactly right. And as a result of that, uh, you then have an intensification of the economics of both sides. It means that Europe can grow more rapidly because it has more customers to sell to, namely the entire American market of 300 million or so. We have now a market of 495 million people to sell to in Europe that we didn't have before, or didn't have completely before. And so that enables us to stimulate our industry. Capital flows back and forth much more rapidly than it otherwise would do. And we both go up the scale together. And other countries seeing that may be tempted to want to join that arrangement because it's turned out to be good for the United States and Europe. Couldn't it be good for them as well? So the, the question that immediately comes to mind, just looking at Europe and the US, how realistic is that uh, uh, happening? Uh, or is this kind of an ideal that you as a theorist project into the future uh, as a place to possibly guide our policy into the future? Well, I think one has to look at that from two points of view. One point of view is, are we going to negotiate for something like that? I think the answer to that is yes, because negotiations are already in mm -hmm. process. Some of them will be concluded by the end of the year. Tariffs will reduce further. Non-tariff barriers will also be reduced further. The flow of capital will increase, et cetera, et cetera. So that in terms of, as a policy, um, Daymarsh, will it take place? It may, it may take place. The question is, how successful will it be even if it does take place? Uh, you could say, you know, the, Europe has not grown very rapidly. The United States recently has not grown very rapidly. We're both into austerity now in terms of our debt limits, and, and the Europeans are cutting back, we're cutting back. All of those things could be very negative. On the other hand, I think if 
one looks at, at history and at the unification of the United States, you could have imagined a United States that broke up. You could have imagined um, a New York which did not get on with Massachusetts or a New York that didn't get on with Virginia. You could have had tariffs among each colony against the other colonies and the trade among them then would have deteriorated. There might not have been a single currency that you would rely on uh, and things would not be worth a continental as it was said in the old days. But that's not what happened. It was the opening up of what had been previous tariffs that allowed these states to trade with one another in a massive way. And as the United States was able to expand, uh, getting new population, uh, new resources, and so on, uh, to the West, the demand for the goods of the Eastern uh, colonies and then the Eastern states grew, and the growth of the United States also growth, grew much more rapidly. Now, if the growth of the United States went up as it expanded to become three million square miles from the then 400,000 square miles of the colonies, couldn't it also take place in terms of the United States and Europe, where you move to uh, a huge area in world politics where there is free trade within and demand increases and the growth of that larger grouping goes up as well? Uh, there are commonalities in the cultures of Europe and the U.S. Right. Uh, our civilization grew out of theirs. But uh, in recent times, there are very great cultural differences political issue, on political issues, on social welfare issues, uh, and so on. So, so wouldn't yeah. that be uh, a stumbling block to the ideal, or is it your belief that the economic dimension would lead and the rest would follow? Well, it is my feeling that the economic dimension would lead. I mean, look at the unification of Europe entirely aside from the United States. The differences within Europe were very mm -hmm. great. Certainly there were major differences between France and Germany. Uh, there were differences between Germany and Poland. There were differences between all of these eastern states that later joined the European Union and the original members that, that were uh, Italy and uh, Britain and Benelux and Germany. But those were overcome and one country after another joined the European Union. Um, and as a result, the growth of the whole went up uh, and uh, there is now a common currency that covers 17 of the 27 and now 28 members of the European Union. And once we get out of this recession, that growth is going to start up once again and it will attract other countries to join. Uh, ultimately, I think Ukraine will join, Moldova will join, um, uh, some of the stands will join. You could imagine uh, uh, Baku and Azerbaijan joining. So there are a lot of countries that seem to be culturally different that find the economics so compelling that they want to join anyway. Now, now you make an important point in the book looking at the past history of how you bring international stability and order. And, and we've talked about the balance of power and, and uh, how that worked at some time in the past. Uh, after the World War II, the goal was to build international institutions, uh, uh, the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, and so on, that would create an international order. And, and what, what you're arguing here is following the European Union model, the development right. of a core which reaches outward and, and uh, brings in more members. So you right. say, in the case of the European Union, people weren't uh, organizing outside of the Union to fight the Union, they, they basically wanted in the door. That's right, that's exactly right. And I think if one looks at the organizations that aimed at total membership, uh, a United Nations of 192 members or 194 or whatever, um, was going to be least common denominator. The kinds of commitments that would be involved would be those that were the least demanding. Uh, even with something like the G20, you know, which has 
some important countries in it, including India and China and so on. Yet what they could agree upon was still much more limited. The advantage of the European approach is they don't make limited demands. They make pretty substantial mm -hmm. demands on each new member that has to support the acquis communautaire. And as a result of that, there is this basic loss of some degree of economic sovereignty on joining. Now, once you've joined, it effectively means we're not going to fight with anyone else that's within the union. Maybe we'll have problems outside, et cetera, et cetera, but we're not anymore going to have France fighting Germany uh, or Belgium being extremely worried about what's going on in Italy or other places. So that I think that in one sense, this method of starting with a core that has a high standard and then attracting others to that core is a recipe not only for bringing others in, but bringing them in at a level which will prevent conflict between them in a military sense. Mm -hmm. uh, in, when, when you go, there, there is a chapter which is more theoretical, which looks at the story of, of the international economy right. and the development of the firm, essentially, right. as, a, as a global firm. Right. And from that, you, you draw uh, some interesting conclusions uh, which, which looks at the firm and how it is changing the state. The, the assumption always was that all states are alike. Right. And, and that sets the, the stage for the, this competitive arena. But now we have global supply change right. that change that equation. Explain that because that is critical for understanding where China actually is and, and what the future global economy looks like. Yes, well, I think that's a terribly important point. And basically what's happened is, is, as you quite correctly say, the development of the international economy has influenced the development of international politics. States want to do as well as their corporations are doing. Certainly they don't want to lose out or lose their economic growth. The corporations have already plowed the way. They have produced abroad, they have sold abroad, they have resourced both labor and raw materials abroad and they've capitalized by being very economical in doing so. And some of these corporations have reached the level of economies of scale. That is, the more they produce, the lower the costs are of the particular item they're producing. That makes them extraordinarily competitive. Now, states haven't yet quite fully understood that, but they want to do the same sort of thing that corporations have done in order to be effective uh, in dealing with other states. And that means they have also to, to, in a sense, capitalize upon production abroad, technology from abroad, capital from abroad, and so on. If all the capital left particular countries and went to other countries, those that lost the capital would show very great declines in the rate of growth, as happened briefly to East Asia after 1997-98. So states also have to think about the same sort of things that corporations do. Mm -hmm. and, and you point out that it, it, uh, if you look at certain industries, uh, civilian aircraft, software, microprocessors, finance, uh, even uh, cinema and entertainment, that, that what you have in those industries are uh, a handful of world-class firms yes. that, that have uh, located parts of their supply chain uh, and production chain in different parts uh, of the world, but, right. all, but often in a particular region. Yes, that's right. And uh, the net result of that is if you're trying to compete with those extremely efficient suppliers, the ones with economies of scale from outside, it's very difficult just to crash the gate uh, because so much high tech, so much finance is already involved so much labor uh, competence is already involved in these firms. For someone to come in from outside is very difficult. One of the points I made in China in a recent lecture was that the conventional affairs, I mean the conventional defense industry, uh, is also an industry of, of economies of scale, largely mo monopolized by Western states and Western firms. Um, and I made this point, and, and my interlocutor in Shanghai raised his hand and said, well, Professor Rosecrans, 
does that mean if we were going to attack you, we would have to buy our stuff from you to begin with? <laughs> and my answer was, yes, you would. <laughs> because you would be unlikely on your own mm -hmm. to be able to manufacture at those very, very high degree uh, of efficiency requirements. Now, uh, one of the, the uh, key uh, features uh, of uh, this world I that we're living in is the rise of China. Yes. And you relate that to the, the historical record with what has happened to world order and stability in the face of a confrontation between a power that has been preeminent or powers that have been right. preeminent and may be on the threshold of some sort of decline versus their new adversary, a rising tower. And, and in, in most historical cases, that has led to war. That's right. In fact, there are only a few cases in which it did not do so. I mean, the Soviet Union tried to pass us, but did not succeed, and there wasn't a war, although there were plenty of crises. The British uh, were passed by the Germans, and that did lead to the conflict of World War I. The British at about the same time were passed by the United States, but there was no conflict between the United States and, uh, and Britain, partly because the British gave us everything we wanted, uh, and so we didn't have any need to do that. But if there is a point at which China passes the United States, these issues will come up once again. Will we be willing to concede just as much to China as Britain conceded to us in 1890 and 1900 and 1910? I don't think so. So we must therefore find a way of drawing China in at the very time when it's on the threshold of passing us. And I think that's what the book is really about. Mm -hmm. so, so at one level, uh, you, there, there are several things in your book that relate to China. One is that uh, it, the first order, uh, a union between, a custom union between the U.S. and Europe right. would create a power uh, that, that essentially would give us leverage in dealing yes. with the rise of the East. That's right. In other words, we would, by uniting ver uh, horizontally with Europe, we would get an amount of power, 32 trillion or something mm -hmm. like that, that would be much higher than any China could possibly get in the foreseeable future. That would draw China in because it couldn't beat it. But then you were going to make another point. Well, the other point being that at some point in the future, then this might be uh, a vehicle, a platform for bringing China on board yes. to this union, which would then deal with this problem that we were just discussing, namely the, the historical record is that the, the rising power, uh, uh, when it confronts the, 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 the powers that be, uh, essentially what we get is war. That's right. You'd have so strong an overbalance that it would be an attractive overbalance. Uh, and you'd admit the Chinese. Now, one of the crucial questions is, could China sustain that if it remained a totally authoritarian polity? And I think the answer to that is probably not. We'd have to see a modernization in China and a focus on international trade and a reciprocity to the trade of others, both in terms of balance in, in exports and in terms of balance of capital investment and so on. So far, we don't have that. Uh, but it is interesting in the TPP, which is now being negotiated. In that a, is the, the, this trade agreement. The Trans-Pacific yeah. Partnership. This is the Pacific aspect, yeah. not the Atlantic aspect. Yeah, sure. But insofar as this is being negotiated, we are considering as possible joiners Vietnam, which is not a fully democratic state, to say the very least, and, and also uh, Singapore, which still is under various mm -hmm. kinds of democratic restraints. So the Chinese have come to us recently and said, hey, you Americans, if you're willing to admit Vietnam, why not us? And so I think the real question we're going to have to elaborate in the next four to five years is how much change will be necessary in China for us to allow the Chinese to join an open economic partnership with the West? That will be the key question. And, and going back to the argument about the European Union, their, the core has values uh, and uh, thresholds that have to be right, crossed right. before uh, uh, there can be membership. Now, uh, you make the point when you're talking about these uh, industries 
uh, that they are often located in particular places. In fact, you, you say at the moment there are between 20 and 40 urban areas on a worldwide basis that stimulate and house new industries. Eight are in Asia, three are in Latin America, 13 in Western Europe, and another seven in North America. Right. Now, there, there are two pieces to this. One, you're arguing that the, the, the West has a real advantage here. Yes. And that what this model of the firm and what's actually going on in the international economy, you say uh, the key point is we are increasing the regionalization of globalization. Yes. Uh, uh, globalization works where regional economies of scale are concentrated. Yes. Now, the, the, the whole uh, world order established after World War II yes. what w was built on a liberal order of rules that applied it for everybody yes. who would be part of, yes. of uh, the emerging free trade system. So, so the question is, in, in terms of your model, is this a way of dealing with the, the breakup in a way, the failure, the decline of the, the international order that we've had since World War II, and focusing on a, on a regional model, which would then be perceived by someone like China as a threat uh, in the short term, not in the long term? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Why? Um, the, the reason is that basically, um, if you try to, to have a totally open international organization in which all the parties are on exactly the same level, one state is the same as every other state in the General Assembly, one state is the same as every other state in the League of Nations or uh, in many other organizations, then you don't get the kind of organization that you need in order to sustain those countries continuing to work together. On the other hand, uh, if you use the model that's based upon these regional concentrations of economic power, economies of scale, and so on, you can attract others into that, and you can offer others that are outside parts of the action. Uh, right now, for example, the Chinese are developing a free trade unit in Shanghai that they hope is going to be like what we have in Silicon Valley or what we have like uh, in the northeast of the United States or what exists um, in, in Europe, you know, between London and Frankfurt and so on. Uh, they are also trying to get advantages from a regionalization of their scale where, of course, certain areas will be much more developed than others. And as the Chinese move to do this in other places as well, Hong Kong, Guangdong could be another one of great significance. But it would not be just the same across the entire region, and it wouldn't suggest that all countries are the same. Mm -hmm. But but that was the assumption of the order after World War II. Yes, wasn't it was. It? Yeah, and and in fact we that assumption is incorrect. Right, right. Yes, and, yes. And we've come up again. Now now you are in in the, in the course of your analysis, you are really raising important questions about the vulnerability of the Chinese as they rise. Yes. One of your points is that when you look at these food chains, if we can call them that, that that in fact. They're, they often, well, they, they, in most cases, they're not on the top. They are a piece of the action, right. but, but they are not the, at, at the top of the food chain in, 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 in the way of the value they extract and, and their control of innovation and design. Yes, of course, that is a very good thing in a way. I mean, for us. A, for us, yeah. yeah. But it doesn't mean we want to keep them down because, in a certain sense, we know that their value added is going to increase mm -hmm. over time but it's value added that they get as a result of a relationship with us, a relationship of Western countries, American companies, and so on. Uh, and um, if they were to try to do this on their own without these food chains, as you say, or production chains, mm -hmm. they would have much greater difficulty doing it, and perhaps mm -hmm. they might not be able to do it. It's because they're linked in to Western technology that their growth really becomes possible. So that's, that's what's in it for them in terms mm -hmm. of association, because it means in the longer term, they will become an effective economic power in a way that Russia never did become. You, you're also very skeptical of 
the the rise of the East in this sense that that you don't see uh, as of yet there being a core that that what you have is more individual countries that are doing well with with China obviously you know as the dominant one but but you don't see uh, the, the 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 location of the core I guess is what that's right I mean. Um as Taro Aso said not too long ago, we Japanese have hated China for a thousand years. Why should anything be any different now? The mm -hmm. Indians can't stand the Chinese. The Vietnamese hate the Chinese. There are tremendous tensions between Korea uh, and, uh, and, and China. And this exists in Southeast Asia as well with the Malaysians, the Singaporeans, the Indonesians, and so on. So I think the notion that there could be in East Asia something like the formation of a united European Union, I think is something that is not going to occur in our lifetimes and probably in the lifetimes of even of our children. So in, in the, then that argument would lead to the notion that if this Western core would come into being, then it, then it might be a, an attractive ma a magnet yes. for different pieces of the East at different times. Yes, it would definitely be a magnet. It would draw others in, just as the European <clears throat> Union has drawn in countries to its East. Now, you use the term, you know, dismissing or putting aside balance of power, you use the term overbalance. Yes. What, what, explain what that means and, and how the, this is the, essentially the description of what we've been talking about. This is the description, yes. Well, I think that in all major periods where peace breaks out, there has been an overbalance of power. Um, at the end of 1815, there was an overbalance of power of all the great powers getting together and, and then eventually attracting the French as well. So they all worked together in what was then called the Concert of Europe. Um, in 1914, on the other hand, there was not an overbalance. And therefore, Britain and Germany and Austria and so on felt they could challenge and they might get away with it if they acted quickly enough. There was nothing that fully deterred them from doing so. But as we move uh, further on, uh, particularly to World War II uh, and what happened after it, we find a Soviet Union that is trying very hard to balance the United States, we're balancing them and so on. But eventually we get to a point where the Western states have a tremendous overbalance of power. And so much so that people like Gorbachev finally say, gee, I'd rather join them than try to oppose them. Mm -hmm. now, now, there are other problems that you see with China which suggests that <clears throat> the world is not yet where you are. Yes. in terms of envisioning this future. Uh, uh, China is very dependent for its resources, its natural resources yes. uh, uh, coming from the outside. Uh, there, there are real uh, nationalist uh, strains within the Chinese political culture right. that, that often, well, they relate to to Japan, their their victimization in the past, right. uh, among other things, yeah. and and these lacking a democracy, uh, these things uh, on occasion go out of control, and at the same time, the the political leadership uses them to to as a substitute for the the failure of their Marxist Leninist ideology. So the question is, there's a lot going on that suggests they would not be ready. Uh, for the world of overbalancing and be more focused on the world of balancing, which, which then lead, might lead them to build up their military. Which well, they doing. are building yeah, up their yeah, military. Which they're doing. The only question is how far. Uh, yeah. But I think the interesting question for, for the longer term in, in regard to China is which is dominant, economics or politics? Mm -hmm. If economics is dominant, then the Chinese are into a situation where they're dependent substantially, as you pointed out, on the outside world. They have to get resources from there. They have to get energy from there. And in order to pay for those, they have to export. So their openness in the outside world is, is very great. Now, if that brings a change in politics so that they open up e politically inside as they're opening up economically outside, then you get the kind of internal 
political order that can work with other countries. And this has happened in many other cases. It happened in regard to Korea. It started out being extremely uh, authoritarian, and then it became economic, and then finally it became political when it opened to democracy. It happened in Taiwan. It's happening in Indonesia. It's happening in a whole series of other countries. Are we saying China cannot make this shift? I hope not, and I hope that one of the things the United States can do in the next few years, and we're meeting with the Chinese, by the way, in January, is to discuss these very things and how we can work with them, not coercing them in any way to open up not only economically but also politically. So, so if uh, a future Brzezinski or Kissinger uh, of the younger generation uh, had read this book or taken your courses uh, and sought to move down that road that you're describing, what, what, what do you see as, as the important steps, milestones in moving toward this world on the political side? The, the economic side seems to be happening on its own. Yes, well, I think it's happening uh, politically to some degree also. I mean, uh, after all, Teng Xiaoping, when he came in, uh, he moved away from the uh, authoritarianism of the Red Guards and the Cultural Revolution to open up inside as well as opening up outside in terms of foreign trade. And I think the current leadership, which is much more, uh, shall we say, confident than Hu Jintao was, uh, is interested also in moving in this direction. There are studies now going on in the Chinese Politburo of what happened in places like Taiwan, what happened in places like Korea, mm. what happened in cases of other countries that opened up, Singapore and so on. So they are thinking in terms of making this shift. They have to do it gradually mm -hmm. because obviously the Communist Party, you know, is, is going to be changed in a mar remarkable way as this takes place. But what about the U.S.? What can the U.S. do to bring about uh, these changes vis-a-vis -vis Europe? Uh, and then vis-a-vis -vis the East. Well, that's, that's the whole thing of the book, in yeah. a way. What it can do, of course, is to have a much closer relationship with Europe, as it's begun to do under President Obama, with, uh, I mean, the, the Obama assisted the European states that were having difficulty, like Greece, during the crisis of 2008. Those kind of relationships are obviously going to continue buying goods that perhaps otherwise are not going to be sold in the European case. That's, that's very important. And then politically, uh, the European allies in the United States have moved closer together on issues like Afghanistan and Iraq and uh, Syria and, and Libya. And so I think politically and militarily, we're also acting much more closely together than we previously did. As a result of that, we can say to ourselves, we've established something that is so strong here, we can now think of what our joint policy should be toward China. What is the problem in all of this with regard to the whole fight and, and concern about inequality in the United States? In other words, would this uh, resurgence of the West br br bring along the citizenry, because we go back to the problem you identified before, right. uh, 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 and, and I guess the concern there would be about the implications uh, of equality within the United States. Yes, well, that's a very important one. And as you know, inequality has gone up and down. Yeah. Uh, Robert Reich has some interesting statistics on this showing how inequalitarian we are, and he's absolutely right. It's like the 1930s, but one of the things to bear, or the, rather the 1920s, uh, but one of the things to bear in mind is the inequality of the 20s didn't stay with us forever. After World War II, it went down a lot and became much more equalitarian in the 60s and the 70s. Is it possible to do that again? Yes, I think it is possible to do that again. We have to do it again through tax and uh, various other kinds of policies inside that will make for outcomes that are much more equal. I think one of the problems with the, the, the financialization of U.S. industry has been that those outcomes are almost intrinsically going to be unequal. But as production takes over a much greater role, as I think in time it's going to do, 
you will find that the payments will not just be for securitization of an asset that is quite dubious to begin with uh, and then selling it uh, you know, uh, on an exchange where no one knows what's really inside it. But uh, as you move back to manufacturing and real services, I think the amount of inequality in the United States will probably go down because the rewards will not be like those that artificially were there uh, in the late 1990s and the early 2000s. Uh, we're, we're doing this interview uh, at a time when there's great concern about the, the gridlock and the fragmentation uh, in the American political system. And Europe has just gone through a period uh, of uh, where it, it looked for a time as if the euro wouldn't continue to exist because of the inequality between uh, the periphery and and the core uh, of the European. So, so the question is, uh, where do you see do you see the domestic politics of either place, mm -hmm. Europe or the United States, buying into your model? Absolutely, uh, because if you think about it even the inequalities that exist within Europe and also within the United States may have an international advantage. If you've got a Greece inside your Euro zone, the value of the Euro that emerges as a result of that is less than it otherwise would be. That means European industry has a comparative advantage selling in Asia and selling other places. If the United States also has had a lot of advantages of having states in the 1840s, for example, that had financial problems and some of them defaulted. The value of the dollar then went down. That made it easier for the United States to sell overseas. The value of the dollar now is low. In fact, I hate to say this uh, in a way, <laughs> but it, the, the very crisis that we're in now has advantaged the U.S. position mm -hmm. on an international basis. Uh, finally, what about our political institutions? We've talked about China's political institutions, but we're in, in, in late October before a, a, a deal has been reached on the debt ceiling. Uh, it, it appears that, that our institutions aren't flexible and adaptable to uh, meeting the challenges that are going to be required if, if you're going to move to the ideal you're proposing. I think there's a sense in which for both Europe and the United States, de facto is not always equal to de jure. There has been no structural reform in Europe. There are still all sorts of difficulties in terms of constitutional change. The German constitutional court may object to it and so on. So what they do is they deal with problems de facto. In the American case, the American constitutional order isn't perfect because it's not quite clear if there's any institution inside the United States that has sovereignty. The king or the queen in parliament has sovereignty in Britain. There's no such thing in the United States because of checks and balances and the separation of powers. So we're going to have some degree of uncertainty domestically. The question is, will everyone come together in a crisis? And just as has been true in Europe, U.S. institutions always come together in a crisis. Well, on that note, uh, Dick, let me show our audience uh, your book again. And uh, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to come back to Berkeley and, and talk about your ideas about the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great and, to see you. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history. Mm -hmm.